whose protected harbor, painted by Paul Kane in 1847, had been inhabited for centuries by the people who carved the poles in Thunderbird Park, who lived in the narrow band between the wild sea of the killer whale and Sisiu, the two-headed serpent, and the dark forests of Kuitsin, the grizzly bear, and Zunaqua, the wild woman of the woods. We remember those first people with our public art, our street names, our hands of time sculptures like these of camas bulbs, once a dietary staple, and these of hands carving a canoe paddle. Beneath the gorge rapids, a sacred stone represents the transformation of the young girl Kamosung into the guardian of the food resources of the Songhees people, who wintered in houses like this causeway photograph or the Mungo Martin House with its Kwakwakiwak frontal paintings, in spaces like this replica interior flickering firelight, encircling dark, storytellers and dancers, bringing life to transforming ancestral spirits drawn from the mysterious surrounding world. In 1788, McQuinna, a Mauchawat chief, is believed to have met Captain James Cook, the first representative of the British Crown to see Vancouver Island, and who brought with him concepts of measurement that were to have vast consequences for the people living here. In 1790, Manuel Kemper, commemorated by these monuments in Souk, visited Souk Harbor and anchored in Pitter Bay, where he met members of the Strait Salish. In 1792, Captain George Vancouver, whose image tops the legislature, explored the BC coast in the Sloop of War, Discovery. Accompanied by the botanist Archibald Menzies, remembered by a street name and by our iconic tree, Arbutus Menzizi, and meeting in Nootka with the Spanish captain, Bodegue Quadra. Then for 40 years, while Europeans traded on this coast for otter pelts, no one paid much attention to this harbor. Meanwhile, in London, in 1837, a new age dawned with the crowning of a young queen. Arriving in 1843 aboard the steamship Beaver, James Douglas landed at McNeil Bay and selected what was then known as Port Comosac as the site for Hudson's Bay Fort. A fort built with native help is shown in this offensive mural, since painted over, but dramatically demonstrating the colonial attitude to the first people. These government street lines and crests show the location of the fort which was then renamed in honor of Queen Victoria. The fur trade celebrated in this cathedral window involved the sale of Hudson's Bay blankets shown on this Hands of Time sculpture on Douglas Street. Trade goods came in tall ships like the Thermopylae to the anchorage off Royal Roads, commemorated by this monument in the Squibalt Lagoon. Or entering Victoria Harbor, referenced by this Hands of Time sculpture, tying up at these still existing mooring rings, unloading into the warehouse whose stone foundation now forms the wall below Wharf Street, and establishing Victoria's intimate connection to the sea, celebrated by this Hands of Time sculpture. For the next 20 years, James Douglas, remembered by a monument and a street name, dominated the histories of both city and province, serving as chief factor, as governor of Vancouver Island, and as governor of British Columbia. Craig Flower's school opened in 1854. When the 1858 gold rust shown in this Hands of Time sculpture flooded Victoria with gold seekers, Judge Matthew Bailey Begbie was sent out by England to bring British law to the colony. In the same year, four Sisters of St. Anne began classes in this schoolhouse and built a chapel, now the oldest section of St. Anne's Academy. 1858 also saw the creation of the Colony of British Columbia, commemorated by this plaque and the Centennial Fountain with its symbolic animals, the bear for New Caledonia, the raven for Queen Charlotte Island, the wolf for Stikine Territory, and the eagle for Vancouver Island. In 1860, the first colonial assembly sat in what was known as the bird cages, and Fiskard Lighthouse was built to mark a Squimalt Harbor. Point Ella's house dates from 1861. The 1862 incorporation of the city of Victoria is commemorated by the Centennial Fountain with mosaic totems illustrating growth and maturation. The 1865 home of Frederick James and Anna Letitia Roscoe shows us a contemporary vestibule, kitchen, child's bedroom, dining room, and drawing room. 
the Church of Our Lord opened in 1870. When, in 1871, B.C. voted to join Canada, a country brought into existence by Sir John A. Macdonald, our entry was negotiated in part by Dr. Sebastian Helmican, later Speaker of the Legislature, whose house remains a memorial and a museum. Pioneer Square, the 1855 burying ground, of which only a few graves are preserved, was closed in 1873 after the purchase of 27 acres from Isabella Ross for the Ross Bay Cemetery, where many Victorians, the well-known and the not-so-well-known, are buried. The Customs House dates from 1875, when Victoria was the main port on Canada's west coast. These Burnside murals honor the arrival of new settlers and salmon as an important resource and occupation. Exploration expanded our knowledge of the island. Steam was gradually replacing sail. The Royal Oak Schoolhouse opened in 1884, and in 1886 Victoria was connected to the Canadian railway system. The City Hall was opened in 1890. In 1891, Rogers Chocolates opened in this location, and Canadian Pacific Empress Liners connected Victoria to the Orient. Queen Victoria's 1897 Diamond Jubilee was commemorated by this window in the legislature, and coastal defenses were strengthened by a 6-inch disappearing gun at Fort Rod Hill and a 6-pounder at Dunce Head. The new Parliament building, designed by Francis Rattenbury, opened in 1898, with murals honoring BC's main industries logging, farming, mining, and fishing. In 1899, firefighters who died in the line of duty were remembered by this bell in Centennial Square. The 280 Canadians who died in the 1899 South African War included men from Victoria. While bicycles gave average citizens a new mobility, the 1903 Princess of Victoria brought a new elegance to the Victoria-Seattle-Vancouver route. Victoria's whaling industry, which began in 1905, is recalled by museum displays and this West Coast Spirit sculpture. In 1906, Victoria's library moved to a new location. In 1908, the Rattenbury-designed Empress Hotel opened, and coal magnate Robert Dunsmuir built Hatley Castle. A Hands of Time sculpture and cathedral windows celebrate the importance of education, represented by Victoria High School, which opened in May 1914. August 1914, and Canada was at war. The Canadian Navy had barely a dozen ships, but Premier McBride moved quickly to buy us a couple of submarines. The Bay Street Armory was opened, and hundreds of Victorians stepped forward to serve king and country. In the trenches, and in small planes like this SE-5 in aerial combat over France, HMCS Galliano, the only Canadian ship lost during the war, went down in a storm with all hands in October 1918. We remember those who served with these plaques in the legislature, with the Saanich War Memorial Health Center on Royal Oak Avenue, with the honor roll in the Saanich archives, and with the 1,500 plane trees planted along Shelbourne Street, one tree for every British Columbian lost in the war. And we remember those British Columbians who won the Victoria Cross. In 1916, the Ogden Point breakwater was built with over a million tons of quarried stone. In 1918, the Princess Sophia ran on a reef and was lost with all her passengers and crew. These Burnside murals honor the importance of fishing and agriculture in the post-war years and the galloping goose that ran out to souk until 1931. Construction projects were undertaken in many parts of the city. Bouchard Gardens opened in 1921. Influenced by the Group of Seven, Emily Carr developed during the 1920s the bold, hallucinatory style that has made her British Columbia's most famous and best-loved painter. In 1929, in Mayer's Grove in Beacon Hill Park, Winston Churchill planted this hawthorn to commemorate his visit to Victoria. And on October 29th of that year, this headline signaled the beginning of the Great Depression. The 1931 Causeway Tower was topped with a searchlight to guide arriving seaplanes. A monument and a plaque remember the nearly 1,500 Canadians of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion who fought fascism in Spain between 1936 and 1938. The prosperity foreseen by the colonists in 1937 did not return until turmoil overseas involved Canada in another European war. In 1939, under the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, air crew began training at Pat Bay and some of the aircraft now on display at the Aviation Museum. The pilots 
basic training began in Harvard's before moving on to the twin engine Avro Anson's. And for the 179 young men whose names are recorded in this memorial, to death in flying accidents. The survivors went on to fly Spitfires or Lancasters in a war that claimed over 17,000 from the RCAF. When Japan declared war, Force anti-aircraft guns were in place at Macaulay Point and cancels began flying anti-submarine patrols along the coast. The Fishermen's Reserve, or Gumboot Navy, trained fishermen to patrol the coast and converted fishing vessels like the HMCS Alaverde. And the Japanese Canadians who had donated Victoria's first cherry trees and who were deeply involved in the fishing industry had their boats seized and were interned in camps in BC and across Canada. June 6, 1944, following naval and air bombardment of German defenses, units of Canadian infantry and of Canadian and British armor landed on Normandy's Juneau Beach. After the Battle of Falaise Gap, the Canadian Army won honors at Deventer in the Netherlands, whose liberation is celebrated by this carillon. By the end of the war, Canada had lost over 40,000 military dead and another 1,600 in the Merchant Navy. These men are 13 of the 16 Canadians who won the Victoria Cross during the Second World War. After the industry and prosperity of the immediate post-war years, in 1950, in Korea, 25,000 Canadians went to war in old tanks and new aircraft, and 516 Canadians died. 1952 overturned the politics of British Columbia, and 1953 brought the coronation of Elizabeth II as Queen and Head of the Commonwealth. We now commemorate her visit of 1959, her Golden Jubilee of 2012, and keep her image in a Hall of Honor in the Legislature. A Hands of Time mirror reflects Victoria's inner harbor, destination in the 1950s of the Princess ships, and still the home port of many fishing boats. The city was always changing. The military, including Victoria's Royal Scots, retained their importance as Canada became increasingly involved in United Nations peacekeeping missions. In 1967, HMCS Skeena was the world's most modern anti-submarine vessel, and the highly advanced Avro Arrow flew in 1958 before being cancelled in 1959. We continue to honor the military, but more as individuals, like John Mason, who rose from Stoker to the captain of a destroyer. Or these of a sailor home from the sea. And our newest military monument suggests we no longer see ourselves primarily as warriors. We remember firemen and law enforcement officers who died in service to the community. Our public art has begun to commemorate particular sports heroes and to honor sport generally. And in 1994, we hosted the Commonwealth Games. Now, instead of the military and politicians, we honor notable citizens like Michael Williams, who was responsible for restoring much of Victoria's old town, or just average citizens like these sculptures in Sydney, The local residents whose footprints overlay this map of Burnside Gorge, Ray, who represents early settlers in Blankensop Valley, and Shaker, the fisherman and his dog on Humboldt Street. We still show our affection for the old queen, but with less reverence for royalty. Public art today can be whimsical, playful, decorative, imaginative, commercial, abstract, or it can be hallucinatory graffiti unveiling the shapes and colors of our collective unconscious. By Canada's 150th birthday celebrated by this mosaic and plaque, the harbour painted by Paul Kane in 1847 had become the busy gateway to a modern city, a city with its traffic and its tourists, a city that celebrates its cultural diversity with these Burnside murals, 
this mosaic pillar at Oakland's Community Center, and this Caledonia Street sculpture to trust and harmony. These images of infusing spirits represent Victoria's overlapping cultures, but more importantly, they are a belated recognition of the importance of our First Peoples, shown in the Saanich Municipal Hall mural to the three nations on whose unceded land the city stands, by new totem poles in various parts of the city, by First Nations images on the breakwater, and by Bo Dick's spindle world castings listed here and marking places significant to the Songhees and Esquimalt people. Cradleboards were once placed at Songhees Point for the spiritual power of the water. This was the southwest bastion of Fort Victoria which brought many changes to the Lekongan people. From here, creeks bordered with bitter cherry meandered down to the sea. Wosikum, place of mud, held important clam beds. Mikwan, warmed by the sun on Beacon Hill, was a place for rest and play. This spindle honors the Royal BC Museum with its collection of Likwangan art. And Laurel Point was the site of a 19th century First Nations burying ground. Reconciliation may be a work in progress, but First Nations now participate proudly in our Victoria Day Parade. Our British heritage is honored by a Hands of Time sculpture, by many traces of our imperial and monarchist traditions, and by the Union Club inspired by the classic clubs of London. The Scots, celebrated by the statue to Robbie Burns, and by Craig Derrick Castle, have always played an important role in Victoria's history. A Hands of Time sculpture and murals honor the many Chinese who came as laborers, stayed to settle in Victoria, and added an important new culture to the texture of our city. After years of prejudice, requiring even a segregated cemetery, the government of British Columbia has apologized to the Chinese for their hardship and suffering. Immigrants from China's Pearl River Valley are remembered by this bright pearl sculpture. Dr. Sun Yat-sen has been recognized as one of the great men of the 20th century and Chinese Canadians are now fully integrated into our wider community. The Tanaka Garden is named for the family who operated a Japanese garden in Esquimalt from 1907 to 1942, and the Kakahashi Memorial in Ross Bay remembers Japanese Canadians whose graves were desecrated during World War II. The Japanese exile is commemorated by this plaque in Centennial Square. Victoria is now twinned with the Japanese city of Marioka, and Japanese Canadians make a valued contribution to the Victoria Day Parade. We are a city of many faiths, Anglican, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Jewish, Islam, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, and our one city can boast more varieties of ethnic restaurants than do many entire countries in Europe. We celebrate a wide variety of lifestyles. And this Hands of Time sculpture holding dogwoods, BC's floral emblem, symbolizes Victoria as the province's capital city, appreciating the present and nurturing the future.